everyone. Welcome to the Screen Chronicles. I'm Colby and with me as always is Steve. And today we're joined by a very special guest. If you're listening to us, you probably know him from The Last Kingdom. He is Aldhelm. He is every breath of Mercia. James Northcote, welcome to the Screen Chronicles. Hi guys, thanks so much for having me. Thanks for being on today, James. How are you doing? Yeah, good, good. It's a beautiful day outside, so... I mean, that's uh, it's a it's a good way to be at the moment. How are you doing in with uh, the lockdown and quarantine going right now? Yeah, so it's it's a strange time, I think, for everybody. A, a really difficult time for some people, and a, definitely a difficult time for people involved in you know entertainment, arts, TV, that kind of stuff, because everything has kind of ground to a halt. Um, but you know, for me, I just feel lucky that I'm home safe and uh, with my amazing wife and uh, that we were kind of getting through it day by day cool what are you guys doing to keep yourself busy during the day so as i say i think i think we have to take it day by day yeah we just kind of catch up on the reading that we've always wanted to do get get through those tasks that you always put off and just try actually try and spend just some good quality time together because you know that's one of those things that when you're living like a kind of fairly fast paced life that we all that we all do it's uh it's actually nice to to get some time just to kind of like sit and breathe but it's it's a weird time to be doing that kind of thing when you realize that there are other people out there who are you know going crazy trying to keep this virus under control or people just really struggling under the uh under the pressure of it so it's uh yeah it's it's, it's an odd it's an odd it's not it's an odd way to live but you know we're, we're pretty lucky yeah yeah so season four just came out and it was awesome. Great job once again. Congratulations on that. Before we get into some more of the season four talk, we'd like to talk a little bit about how you got into acting just to get started. Okay. Yeah. I don't want to give you like a long, long life story, um, but I, I, I got into it when I was pretty young. Not, not like a, I was never a child actor or um, like in anything professional, but I... Uh, according to my family I had a had a really bad lisp when I was a kid which I can imagine is was like unbearably cute or probably just un unbearably obnoxious <laughs> um, and so uh, the way that this was kind of like dealt with at the the school that I went to um, in in the southwest of England is that there was this kind of old older lady who who taught this thing called speech and drama and basically she had like this this class of a huge class of kids that came and learn to speak, you know, nursery rhymes, poems. And it was a way of kind of getting kids to be more confident or getting rid of speech impediments or, you know, a kind of sort of really basic speech therapy. And most kids would do it for like, I don't know, one or two years and then, you know, get on with their lives, go and do football practice or whatever. Um, but for some reason, I just completely fell in love with just like speaking stuff out loud speaking bits of Shakespeare, speaking bits of poems, uh, you know, wh whatever it was yeah. that she kind of threw at us, um, that I ended up doing it until I was like the only student in the class when I was like 16 wow. at senior school, like, like just the only person doing it at this point. And she was just such an amazing teacher and a, I don't know, like a, a, kind, of, a kind of mentor. And I never really thought of it as acting, but Okay. I, I, I kind of look back at it now and I realize that that's where all of my kind of like everything I enjoy about performing, everything I enjoy about um, theater and film and TV yeah. and stuff comes from those like early experiences of just like standing in this class with loads of other kids just speaking stuff out loud. Uh, so I think that's kind of where it started. And there wasn't like a moment where I was like, ah, oh, I want to be an actor. Oh, gotcha. that's what it is for me. I think I just fell in love with with film and TV and theatre and just really wanted to be part of it. And so when I graduated from university and I just done quite a lot of student drama and the opportunity like just presented itself to me that I could be an actor in the industry and that was actually something that might be possible. Um, I just kind of grabbed it with both hands because it was just, you know, I just was really excited to be involved in, awesome. in, in, that, in that stuff. Well, so you say that mentor was a, was a big inspiration of yours um, when you were in school, but do you have any other big acting inspirations? Oh man, I could speak about like the actors that I like all day. Uh, there, are, there are so many of them, and and sometimes I'm not sure if it's just the it's the actors that I'm really inspired by, or just the performances, because you know the, like, right. the line, the line feels so so thin between an actor and their performance when it's when it's really yeah. um, when it's really like spot on. But I I think the first actor that I was like 
that's who I want to be, was Alec Guinness in, uh, uh, in the first Star Wars film. Here we go. Oh, I, which, I, mean, I, think every, I think every actor of around my age is like you know, the first Star Wars film. Like, it, was such a, it was such a watershed moment for, for cinema and, like, and popular cinema and kids. And, like, cinema that was like, you know, good for adults, good for kids, good for yeah. everyone. Everyone just fell in love with it. And uh, we had a babysitter at the time that when my parents went away for work, she'd bring around these, these like, I don't know, this, this sacred Star Wars uh, videos. And I, I probably watched it way later than everybody else, like, because I, we only were allowed to watch stuff on video at my house. We weren't allowed, like, live TV or anything. And she'd bring them around and we'd watch them before school. And it was like, for me and my brother, it was like the greatest thing. Yeah. And Alec Guinness, I, I always was like, he's the actor I want to be. And I realised later <laughs> that I would say that, but actually I'd basically never seen anything else that he'd been in apart from that i was just like i just want to be that jedi that, that totally. ghostly jedi that's that's what i want to be but then later actually like really more recently i saw um the original tinker tailor soldier spy have you guys ever ever seen that it's the, the, original? It's the tv series that then they made into a film with you know that it come about and Colin oh. and uh, and he plays smiley who's like the spy master and it's just one of the most incredible performances like ever it's he's so quiet and who so Benedict Cumberbatch uh no this no this is uh, this is Alec Guinness, Alec Guinness oh Alec Guinness smiley. oh gotcha yeah, yeah the original the one original smiley the yeah. original one. gotcha yeah. because Gary Oldman plays it in, amazingly uh as well in the film um but yeah Alec Guinness as uh, as Michael Smiley is is was like a a real like real uh, like a real turning point in like my appreciation of him as an actor but I I like so many actors like I really fell in love with Juliette Binoche, um, the French actor, um, when I was okay. in my teens. I thought she was incredible. Tilda Swinton and all the work that she does with Derek Jarman. Um, that, I mean, there's, there's, just, there's just too many. Like, there's, there's too many actors that have inspired me and I just, like, each and every one of them kind of is a little piece of the stuff that I put together whenever I'm, like, cool. approaching a role. So just curious, because we're, we're big Star Wars fans too. How would you think of Ewan McGregor taking over as Obi-Wan? What would you think of his performance? Of it? I think he gets a lot of flack for that oh, really? because no no because uh, because you know what shoes to fill like the oh original God. obi-wan like what shoes to fill i think uh mcgregor's like a like a really brilliant actor when you oh, see yeah. the stuff that he does in you know train spotting or whatever he's 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 so excellent so you know th there's always got to be a transition hasn't there in 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 any fit in any kind of film franchise that you know goes off into the future in the way that i mean star wars is probably the only one that's had the longevity of of, of star wars uh yeah. but yeah i think he did i think he did, did a great job like you know oh, we love him big, he's, big, he's big one of our fans for sure yeah. <laughs> we love him <laughs> oh great okay good good, good. no we love him yeah. what about what was one of your did you have like a favorite shakespeare play or maybe a sonnet that you got into back when you were rehearsing these lines was there something that kind of stuck for you I mean, yes, yeah, there's, there's so many, there's so many like great Shakespeare, you know, soliloquies, sonnets, um, material that uh, as an actor is so lovely to get your like mouth around. Um, I was, I was obsessed with the character of Ariel when I was a kid, I think maybe because it's quite a good kids role and I wasn't doing it in a play. I was just kind of like working on the, um, the, some of the monologues in Midsummer Night's Dream. But I think anything that was kind of magical or mysterious or kind of fantastical because whilst I was doing all this kind of you know like learning to speak Shakespeare learning to speak poetry and stuff I think was my favorite books were Lord of the Rings I was a massive geek as a kid uh, and anything that had that kind of like you know <laughs> mythology and fantasy totally. and like these, these magical worlds that I could like really like dive into anything like that was I, I just i just devour and there's loads of that in shakespeare um i'm not sure it's like the, the thing that we always think of straight away when we think of shakespeare but it's full of magic and it's full of fantasy and i love that stuff in it we thought there were times in season four where it kind of felt like lord of the rings a little bit we were talking on one of our other episodes especially like when you're uh with ethel flood hiding under that rock uh when citric comes up it was like, oh, this is like totally when Frodo and the boys were, were hiding under the rock. But anyway, and just like the journeys through the woods. Yeah, it was uh, the quarantine episode where everyone's running through the woods. Yeah. Cool. The COVID-19 episode. Yeah, it reminds yeah, us, yeah, like, when they're the Lord of the Rings, when they're traveling. Yeah, it's a bit, it's a bit close to the bone, that plague narrative now. <laughs> yes. Now that we're actually in a plague. Yes, it was, it was so weird. Um, obviously, you guys shot this, what, a year or two ago, though, right? Like We shot this about... 
eight months ago. I mean, okay. we, we shot we shot it for much earlier in the year, but I think we we wrapped up in sort of uh, October, November time, gotcha. October time, and um, and actually, I think in some ways because of everything that's gone on, they actually accelerated the release slightly. I mean, I don't know that for sure, but it's um, usually it's a little longer the, the 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 timing in terms of when we shoot it and when it's actually released. So uh, yeah, we sh we shot it in like high high summer, like high summer and autumn in Hungary. Cool. Yeah. So just a quick spoiler alert for anyone out there too listening to this, but we we are going to talk about season four of The Last King. So you haven't seen it? Check it out. James is in there as Outhound. Uh, but one thing though, getting back to that is, I mean, it was it was so weird uh, when you get into sep episode six and. You know, we're watching this, you know, on quarantine ourselves here. Uh, we just got out of school. and We're just been locked down. Uh, but like it kind of brought you back into the world, you know, when you're, you're seeing Finn and like going around trying to keep some social distancing and pouring water on people's hands. And you're just like, whoa, 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 whoa. You know, closing the yeah. borders. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, it yeah, it is, it, it is kind of mad. Um, and you, you don't want to make light of it because, you know, no. we're in a real plague no, and people yeah. are really, like, really suffering. But at the same time, you, I think you, it's easy to forget that those are things that at that time in history yeah. happened regularly and yeah. something that people had to deal with, you know, like what, a couple of times every generation, maybe more. I mean, there were times when, you know, it would sweep through the country every couple of years. Yeah, yeah we forget that that's that dealing with disease is, has always been a big part of the, the human experience. We've just become so, so good at it, you know, in, totally. in, in the modern world. Um, so it, yeah, I mean, like the situation we're in now is a stark reminder that, you know, we're maybe not so different from those people back then who were just right. you know, trying to keep safe, trying to, and uh, trying to not, try not to get ill. Totally. I mean, The Last Kingdom does such a good job too of weaving in the history into the fiction. I, I mean, we love it. And, you know, one of the things this season that they did was the Battle of Tettenhall. Phenomenal. I mean, one of the coolest battles. It's our favorite Last Kingdom episode we've ever seen. Oh, right. <laughs> it was That's so awesome. good. You have an amazing moment in that battle. Hmm. Could you kind of walk us through maybe a little bit about, I don't know, getting ready for that moment and, and doing it uh, when you're with Ethel Fled? Yeah, it was when I read it in the script uh, just before the read through. I, I went up to the writers and, and actually said thank you so much for creating for making this moment that, for me to be able to do because actually mm. it's really it's a really mad it's a really it's a really rare uh thing to get to see um someone caught in that like literally impossible decision uh and, it, and in my case I guess actually you know just choke like in a really really hard hard way in, in some ways it's, you know it's sort of left it's, it's left ambiguous what was I going to do it was I not going to do it um it's, it's actually a question that I kind of I kind of like to leave open because who knows what would have happened. But that hesitation of uh, having to do the one thing that you, that you just never ever want to do um, mm. because because it's the one thing that you have to do in that situation. So I was super grateful to get to have to have that moment to play with. I spoke with uh, Sarah O'Gorman, who directed the, uh, that that block, who's an incredible director, and I thought brought an amazing level of like vulnerability and and also all of the action to those episodes. Um, and we just talked it through, and I, I guess I spoke about it briefly with Millie, and we we weaved it in with the the fight choreography, in amongst the battle. Like there's very little time for uh, kind of like let's you know let's really like delve into the emotions because you're in the middle of as I'm sure other actors have told you you're in the middle of this huge moving machine that's a, a weeks long uh, fight choreography <laughs> um, that like all, all of these moments are going to have to somehow drop into and 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 seamlessly be transferred through like in the filming itself let alone in the actual edit and then the final thing so I just had to do a lot of preparation to know that whenever it was that they were like okay we're going on to this this moment now that I knew I was ready and I knew what I, what I had to work with and I knew what I had inside that I could that I could that I could use and to be honest working with me Millie really helps because she's a really um spontaneous actress um, oh, okay. and she's really uh, she's incre she's very available and um and brilliant to work with and so we just kind of like pieced it through and to be honest in the middle of all of those like all of those, da the Dane stuntmen, all like this huge melee with all of the smoke and all of the sound and all of the adrenaline. It you you actually have to do much less acting than you think because oh, yeah? you know, it's it you're, you're you're there and you're in it and it's happening you're living it. and it like wow. and, you know a lot a lot happens to you rather than you having to make it happen. 
That's amazing. Yeah, that's it was amazing. great. It's a, that I, I think that scene, that whole battle sequence is is really epic. I think they oh they did God. an amazing job with that. I mean, Ridiculous. the whole season, but that that fa- that battle particularly is really incredible. Yeah, I mean, the whole season's good, but for me, I think the first four episodes of the season are just some of the Last Kingdom's best stuff that they've put out. I mean, it was so good. And then the battle just capped it off. I didn't think we were going to get it that early in the season. <laughs> I thought it was going to be like, I saw it in the trailer. I was like, oh, okay, that's like 10. We're waiting for 10 for that. Like, that's nope. not it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Yeah. So what was it like then, uh, winding up for the shoot then, for that week-long choreograph- uh, choreography? Was that something you were preparing before time, or was it really just there? What was it like filming for all that? So for the big battles, we do do quite a lot of preparation. Um, it's, it's, I mean, it, it, it probably does boil down to just a couple of days of fight rehearsals with all of the stunt team. Uh, Leventa Lejac, who's the stunt coordinator, mm-hmm. but also the like the action director now for yeah. the last season, brings everybody together, and we just walk through all of the stunts. Um, and 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 yeah, as I said, with Sarah, talk through all of the the moments that we had to capture as well. I thought kind of more about you know detail and emotion etc um but yeah as as i said it's once once you once you get into it is just like it's like entering you know you know in uh, charlie chaplin charlie chaplin's i think is it modern times where you go where you go or maybe it's city lights where he goes through those gears have you ever seen, have you ever seen that film like he, he falls into a, a factory yeah. and he, and he's like a and he, and he like rolls through <laughs> yeah. these gears going through the factory machine it's an incredible moment in cinema um being in a it being in battle week feels a little bit like that you're just you, oh. you hit you hit the ground and then you just are in you're just in it and you just have to survive I mean, so it's a bit like a, <laughs> a bit like battle itself but uh levente is an incredible stunt coordinator and um the the whole team around uh, the action of the show is really really well honed and really really committed and and to be honest, all of the actors, I think, who do a lot of action, like whether it's Alex, Yeppe, Magnus, and obviously uh, uh, Arnus, Mark, and, and, and Ewan and the whole of Uchers gang, they're, they're really ready for it. They're really up for it. And they really know what they're doing. Um, so you just kind of fit into, you just fit into that. And it's, uh, it's, I actually really enjoy Battle Week, even though it can okay. be really physically grueling, uh, just because you're on set with, like thousands of people pretending to be warriors like i don't know a hundred horses all like yeah. all, all uh, everything that a production can throw cinematically at, uh, at a scene and you're just watching it all unfold and if you're not watching it all unfold you're actually in it doing like fighting and acting and it's i don't know it's like a it's like a childhood dream to get to be part of those scenes yeah. even if like the actual reality of them is quite grueling and quite tough that's amazing that's amazing and you've been involved in in several battle scenes going back to season two um i think at Biamfliot, you you yep. got some some pretty good beats in that and then at the beginning of season three uh in Biamfliot, i think you yell shield wall which steve and i we love our shield wall calls oh yeah uh, oh yeah oh man so a great shield wall call but anyway, i'd, we, love, we I'd want... love to hear your guys shield wall calls i think you should uh all right. should, uh, maybe at the end, maybe maybe when we're off camera, you can I'll do it right now. Seat. Okay. I'll do it. Oh, please, go Shield go. wall. That was great, Steve. Yeah. Did you did you want to get lined up next to me? Did you? Oh, yeah, I, I already grabbed my shield. I yeah. Was ready. I, I, but I, yeah, I had mine on top of my head, just shielding from arrows. That was. Uh, that was fantastic. Second line. <laughs> Colby, you're Super up. Good, Colby, Steve. you got to go now. <clears throat> Shield wall. Ooh. 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 <laughs> what do you think? Be honest, don't be honest. I mean, I'd say you're, that you're both definitely Saxon warriors, uh, which I'm <laughs> super happy about. Um, okay. <laughs> and, and I think you do great. You do great work as uh, Alpha's lieutenants. Oh, all, right, all right, well, we'll take that. Or if you need one. I mean, he's not around anymore, unfortunately. But. So when we rewind back to season two a little bit here, cool. because Aldhelm has one of the coolest story arcs of all the characters in the show, I think. Thank you. When you, when you go into season two and... Let's face it, you're not a very likable character in season two. <laughs> Can you talk to us a little bit about your approach to Aldhelm season two compared to season three compared to season four? I mean, you're right. He has gone on a bit of a crazy journey in terms of you know, the side he's on, who he's loyal to, right. what he believes in. Uh, although I, I would say in terms of my approach, I've always 
it's always been motivated by basically the same thing. Uh, I think the thing that motivates him as a, as a character, or motivates me as Althelm, is that it's just a, a belief in the possibility of an Anglo-Saxon England. Um, yeah. The possibility that, that 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 dream is possible and that it doesn't have to be just the landscape of war and strife and tension and, you know, feuds between various like whether it's Danes or between Saxons like I think he believes in a kind of modern world in the same way that Alfred does mm -hmm. and uh, so from the beginning that's what he's trying to achieve but with his you know with his boss with Ethelred totally um, played by Toby Regbo and at the beginning he thinks that the way to do that is sort of through this kind of I don't know Machiavellian back like in the background puppet master kind of kind of work um, because that's that, that's the kind of method that works for the guy, the kind of guy he's working for in that moment. Right. And I think when he realizes that he needs to change sides, he finds himself with a very different type of leader who he has to serve in a completely different way. Leaving any of the, you know, the romantic um, stuff implications aside, I think he's made better um, by the person that he you know that he that he follows um and okay. he he, fi he yeah. finds like a comp uh, like a different a different way of working and a different way of being um once he um once he joins Ethelflaed. yeah totally yeah and I when you transition to that in season three mm -hmm. it's kind of you're hinting at it we kind of see the expressions on your face a little bit early and then you have this one of the best scenes in season three where you actually go uh to her estate and mm -hmm. sneak through the window and can you walk us through this scene a little bit? Because it's pretty emotional. We don't know what's about to happen. Can you just kind of walk us through that a little bit? Yeah, of course. Because uh, you, I guess uh, as a viewer, you don't know what his intentions are at all because he's been sent ostensibly by Ethelred to, to, kill, <laughs> to kill Ethelred's wife, to kill Ethelfled. Yeah. It was a really fun scene to do because, the, I mean, the whole thing does revolve around this element of surprise and this element of faith that she's not just going to have him killed there in the moment or right. she's not going to just immediately call him out to Ethelred and go what is this guy because as she said she says she says she calls him a hound in the in the scene she she says you're just my husband's hound mm. right he's just this kind of he's just this like person that follows around and, and doesn't really uh doesn't seem to stand up for any real principles but is just you know working away to try and undermine everything that anyone tries to achieve and so he puts himself in this really like in this crazy vulnerable position where he th this woman who he he knows very little he just puts himself on her mercy and says look i need th this is me saving your life you've got to trust that i'm trying to save your life will you accept that as as, as a proposition and it's a situation that again i've been a bit like what we we're talking about in season four like it's a situation that you very rarely like the extremities of some of the situations that the show puts the characters in yeah. uh, and some of the some of the places that I, I like I've been lucky enough to be put in um, as Althelm they're really like interesting conundrums to try and get your head around and so with uh, the uh, director Andy Dermody we just really worked on that confrontation with uh, between me and Millie between uh, Althelm and Ethel Fled um, and and how they negotiate trying to whether they can trust each other what and what and actually what comes out of the end of that scene like where like what is the be what is the world that we begin in when when Altam en enters that chamber with that knife, and what what worlds do we actually end up with on the other right. side of that, right. with a completely new alliance built that even it's maybe not going to be spoken of for you know for half a season, but it's going to change quite a lot. Yeah, it's awesome. I mean, some of the d details in that scene. I think I noticed when you step forward, where she's got the sword to your chest, and you. You take that step toward it. You tell her that you're every breath of mercy. Just super well done, that scene. You guys nailed it. Thank you. Totally nailed it. Yeah, I think that's something you always pick up on, though, with Outham is he, well, at least I think uh, partway through two, season two, you do pick up on, he is always for Mercia. Um, yes. He always seems at the beginning, when, yeah. you, when you first see him, like, oh, he's always that guy whispering to uh, Ethel Red. I get my Ethel's mixed up all the time. <laughs> Who doesn't? <laughs> but then he makes that awesome speech before they're about to go to London. And you're like, oh, all right. He like, it looks like he cares. He like, he genuinely cares about everything there. So is that something you knew then going on that you knew Outham is maybe going to switch sides from Ethel 
red. Mm. Uh, did you know that going into the show? No, that was uh, something that the writer Stephen Butcher came to me with. At like a like a, like a, we were having drinks after I think in the middle of the season, which is something that we do to like keep everyone keep everyone together. The production invites everyone to like have a drink and have a night out all together. Um, like in the middle, it's called the Midway Party. Um, and I think it was I think it was maybe in the Midway Party that it was like okay, this is this is where Al Tom's going. He's actually gonna he's actually gonna switch he's actually gonna switch sides. He's in he's he was like he's he's in love with he's in love with Etherflood. He can't help it. And like I, I was completely and utterly flawed. I was like, that, that is, I, I had no idea that was coming. Like no idea. I was so, my, the way that I saw Altham was he was just absolutely a hundred percent committed to, to Ethelred. Like that they were brothers. Like even if Ethelred's decision making was absolute nonsense, like he was there for him and he was just kind of, he was just ride or die for Ethelred. And so when he, when he, um, when he, when he was like, well, you're actually switching sides. I was like, I can't, I can't even imagine how, how that gear change works but to be honest it was it's per, it's perfect because uh, as you said Althelm's just about Mercia he's not about a particular like king queen you know leader he's just about the, his he's, just, he's, a, he's about his ancestral homeland this is a man who's like a, as far as I can tell and the way that I sort of approach him sort of comes from nowhere doesn't seem to have any real like uh, other family like doesn't have doesn't seem to have children or a wife or he just is this kind of like lone person that has come and, and just and is there just to make sure that Mercia like continues make sure mm-hmm. that it survives in these wars make sure that and and so I don't know he feels like he's just he's motivated by a real love of his land and a love of where he comes from and love of you know wh- whatever whatever family you know made him um, but that he's sort of a bit of a lone wolf, and he'll just attach himself to whoever he thinks really will um, protect Mercia and keep it um, keep it alive. Wow, interesting, interesting. Now, did you uh, before you got the role of Aldhelm? Did you know who he was at all? What you mean from from the books? Yeah. Uh, no, not at all. Um, when I uh, when I auditioned for the role, my agent, well, actually, my agent's assistant rang me up. And he was like, "Oh, there's this, this, this part. There, there's, there's, there's these sides. You've got to go on side." Like, and they, they really played it down, like, like played it down more than any audition I'd ever had. I was like, "Oh, okay, okay." Like, the, the, I get the sides. There's like one line that I have to say, and I'm like, "Okay, so it's just one scene. I'm a guy on a horse. One scene. Okay, I'll go in and do it." And when I arrived at the audition and I met the director um, of that of that block that we started, that me and Toby Regbray started in, it's a guy called Dame, Jamie Donahue. I suddenly realized that the part was actually much, much bigger. Uh, and in order for him to test me, he actually just swapped all of the lines. So I said a lot of Ethelred's lines, because at this point, I don't think they'd written anything else for the character. So they only had this one scene to work with. Um, and so I had no idea of what Althelm could be or, or was even, in, because I mean, he ch- he's in the show, he's changed considerably from how he's presented in the book. Um, but yeah, of course, when I got the role, which was like an incredible moment, um, I, I, I straight away went and, and looked through the books and, and found like the description of his character and tried to like tried to get some idea of like who he was. But I, I pretty quickly realized that I had to let go of that because I could see that they were moving away from like the exact description of him and the exact uh, gotcha. character that he plays in the books. Um, so I, I definitely started with that foundation. Um, and that was that was it was really that was really good to know but I, I had to throw it all away quite quickly <laughs> so if anybody follows the last kingdom on social media they will see these pretty awesome pictures uh photographs i should say thank you um so the man behind the camera is with us today which is pretty sweet uh so tell us a little bit when did your love for photography begin I think I've loved uh, taking pictures or like making like little films and stuff since I was a, since I was a kid. I remember when my uh, parents got their first, I think, digital camera, which is a terrible little like blocky like Sony thing. Like I immediately stole it and went out and made like little films on it and took photos and stuff. I, I mean, I, they must have been like, "Where's that gone? Where's our camera?" I actually sort of didn't I sort of dropped it for a, a long time and it's only when it's actually it was on the set of season two that I started that I got back into it and okay. the reason was is that my unfortunately my grandfather died and we had to clear out his house and we found this this selection of old like not particularly special but just kind of like consumer cameras that he'd collected over the years and he'd obviously taken a lot of photos with 
and um, I pulled one of them out and it was still working, like a really old Olympus camera. It, I think it still had a film in it. Um, and so I just, and this was around the time that we were filming season two. And so I just took it out to Budapest with me and I started just shooting some stuff on set. Um, and Budapest is actually a really great place to do photography because, particularly film photography, because the, um, the labs there are really cheap and they have a really good tradition of like still processing film. Um, so I started shooting stuff out there, started getting it processed and I just fell completely in love. And I think it, it I mean, it's, it's the combination of having a cam uh, of having a camera and being on set for me that I, that I love the most because there's so much weird stuff that goes on on set and there's so many <laughs> things that you see that you just go, oh, I just wish I could capture that. That it's a really nice thing to be doing like in your downtime between scenes when you're just waiting in your trailer. It's a, so yeah, it really, it's something I, I've really fallen in love with whilst doing the show actually. That's awesome. Now I, you just came out with your day in the life of Aldhelm, which was <laughs> probably the coolest one. We, definitely the most unique one. And, yes, and it was pretty awesome video. <laughs> Thank you. You made that video? So actually, I have to give credit where credit is due. My wife actually made that video. Really? Nice. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, because I, I mean, I can't, number one, I, I can't shoot a day in the life of myself. Right. myself. Um, but she's a really excellent photographer and a brilliant filmmaker. And um, she, uh, she was on set one day and I'd been shooting some Super 8 like uh, round and about just of like people, sort of stuff that people were doing because I, I really liked the look of it. And she was like, why don't we just shoot some stuff? Like, like well, why don't we just do a day in the life of, of your character but using your camera? And I was like, yeah, okay. So she came to set the, like maybe only two times in the whole six months because I mean, she was doing other work because um, she's also an actor. And she just shot stuff and kind of came up with a with an idea and we like worked on concept together and uh, edited it together and you know uh, processed it together and did all that stuff and so she is 100 percent the director i was just the uh, the kind of technical editor and uh, an, an operator really um, she did a fantastic job yeah really cool. she did i, I mean I, I, yeah I'm, I'm super lucky it was really fun to do now i think it mentioned in the video you go and you look you were looking for cameras i think do you collect old cameras Yes, I do actually. I think you can probably, uh, and this is, yeah, I didn't it, line them up on purpose, I promise you. Um, but you can see some of my collection of old cameras up there, um, including the Rollerflex that actually my wife bought me as a um, as, as our wedding present, which is, I mean, wow. the sweetest gift I think anyone could ever receive. <laughs> so uh, I do, I do collect old cameras now a little bit, but only to use. Like I don't, I don't collect them just because I want, you know, I, I, you know, they have value or, or just to put them on the wall or, or something. Just to put on the wall or something. Um, gotcha. But, to be to be honest, I have far more than I could possibly use at any one time. It's ridiculous. There were there were times on set and people would literally would laugh at me and completely fair enough, uh, where I'd have five different cameras in my bag, and they go, "Why have you got five different?" And I go, "Well, this one does this, and this one does this, and like this is a different kind of look." And and they go, "Okay, okay, you just maybe bring one." That's awesome. That's awesome. Oh yeah. So when when you're on set then with all these cameras and you know Last Kingdom, I I assume because of all the the big deaths that happen, the new plot lines, are they pretty hush hush about it? Are they kind of how you picture like the Disney Marvel sort of, you know, looming overhead when you're, you're filming and all that? Uh, I mean, they're definitely not, um, they're, it's not draconian. They're not like super, um, uh, they're not like, yeah, they're not, as you say, hovering around being like, what are you doing? Um, they're, they're, they're really supportive actually, because I think they've really enjoyed the content of the cast, like all of the cast, like, I don't know, people like Eliza or Mark or, uh, Alex, like pe people are generating content for social media right. um, in their own ways all the time, and I think they um, appreciate that and actually find it find it useful uh, and uh, and a good thing for the show. But yeah, we are all super um, mindful of spoilers, super mindful mm -hmm. of each other. I think um, I've uh, I, I always try as hard as possible to make sure that people are okay with me taking their photos, and if, if someone new comes to set and they don't know. Uh, that I might take their photo like I always go up and ask them and stuff because not it's not for everybody and, and for some people you know when they're working they want no distraction whatsoever and I completely respect that the last thing I want to do is uh, be like something that's um, nothing nothing other than sort of a, a nice thing to have around um, because you know it's a working environment but no production are, are super great about us um, being creative and you know capturing behind the scenes in, in whatever way that we kind of find fun. Cool. Now you, so you've been on now for three seasons about going back to season two. How have you seen the production grow? Cause I mean, from the viewer standpoint, it seems like each season gets 
you know, more, we got the battle of Teton hall was definitely like the biggest thing I think that you guys have ever done. Yeah. Um, can you tell us about from the inside, like how have you seen the production grow? I think it's just gone from strength to strength each season. I mean, each season is amazing in its own right. I think for season one, that wasn't even part of, I love because it has that really, it starts off with that incredibly gritty documentary style that then has influenced the rest of the show, even as it's become yeah. bigger and kind of more cinematic. People say they see the difference between uh, when Netflix came on board and took the show um, um, sort of officially uh, from the BBC, uh, which I think is season is season three. Right. Um, I'd say just that there was a kind of loosening up of um, violence and mm -hmm. like a kind of and a, and, a, and a desire to create a greater sort of visual scope and 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 bring it more kind of like towards the kind of stuff that Netflix do. That might be true, but to be honest, I think each each series just grows on the experience of the last. And yeah. I think the the heads of department just transfer the experience that they've had on each season to the next and it just kind of grows and grows and grows and and as i said like levent le jacques has been the um, stunt coordinator from the very beginning like he's i mean he's an incredibly experienced stunt coordinator but yeah he's been given more and more i think uh, ability to to shape the stunts and shape and shape the action as as it's gone along and and, and found more creative ways to do things and the different directors come on each season and bring their bring new things so it just kind of i think it just kind of built yeah you know, organically cool now did you watch season one before you got on season two a hundred percent yeah but just because i wanted to know what the vibe of the show was um, gotcha. i hadn't seen it before i'd heard of it i'd, I'd heard that it was a great show and it had this really cool different vibe for a historical drama um, but yeah the, one of the first things I did once I got the role was to just binge that and sort of and get, get an idea of what the show's about and how you know how, how it did things because you know not every historical drama is the same um, we're completely different to like Outlander or you know Vikings or it's, it's we've got we've got we've got our own kind of aesthetic and our own way of um, exploring the history and the story so I wanted to try and find my way into that. So yeah, watching season one was definitely a must. And I really, I really enjoyed it. I think it's got a great, um, great feel to it. Yeah. Oh yeah. Did you know then the history, I guess, of England's formation? Did you learn about King Alfred and that when you were in school? No, not, not at all uh, in school, but as I've already mentioned, I'm a massive geek because when I was growing up, I was like obsessed and really loved the Lord of the Rings books. Um, a lot of that is inspired by both like Norse and Anglo-Saxon mythology. I mean, the people like pe people talk about, I mean, there's, there are names in, for example, the Prose Edda, uh, which is a, um, a Norse like compendium of, um, of mythology that, that like directly are in um, Lord of the Rings, like names of dwarves or names of kind of elven lords and stuff. And so, and because I grew up in the uh, Southwest of England in, in a place called, in a, in a um, county called Somerset like in the middle of nowhere in like in, in in a farming community I was like in the land of like King Arthur and Merlin yeah. and like I mean like Glastonbury is where like Merlin's meant to be buried or something we're like we're, we're like really in the kind of like mist like the mystical uh, end of England uh, where all of the myths and legends are just kind of like swirling around and so I think as as a kid I did read weirdly quite a lot of um, definitely, definitely like Danish, um, Norse mythology, uh, Viking mythology, and and some Anglo-Saxon as well, because um, it all kind of links up with like King Arthur and stuff like that. Um, and so I knew things like the different ways that they um, that they meted out punishment to to like to like robbers or like how they tested if someone was guilty by like putting an iron bar on it, but like a burning bar in their hand from the fire, and then they had to walk like three paces, and if they got blisters, like all this like ludicrous stuff. So coming to this, so coming to the show, obviously I can't pour all of that knowledge into uh, into the, my role as Altelm. But coming to the show, I did. I was super excited about being able to play a character in this time in history because yeah. it's. I mean, it it just was such a fascinating, mad time, and uh, tells us so much about how England as a country and, and great britain as well uh, like formed and became like what, what it is what, whatever that is um and so yeah i was uh, I, I did actually know uh, a little bit about it already and then i just read more and more and more actually one of the things that i did particularly when i realized that the books weren't going to help me out too far um reading bernard cornwall's books yeah 
I um, I just started reading like more Anglo-Saxon literature, like really around the period, like finding out about like how they thought, what they believed, mm. like the world that this was in. And one of the actually one of the best books um, that was recommended to me by Simon Kuntz, who plays Otto the Elder in season two, yeah, is a book called uh, The Wake by Paul Kingsnorth, um, which is about the rebel um armies these sort of like guerrilla bands uh, that fought in the uh, marshlands of the north in the north of england uh, after 1066 when the normans invaded Ooh. and it's amazing it's, it's a novel it's not it's it's not it's not actually like it's not a non-fiction book uh, but okay. it's written in like fake old english and it's okay. to begin with almost impossible to read like so difficult um <laughs> like, really, like really, really almost impossible um but you, you you like weirdly your brain starts to get into it and you st suddenly start to find yourself just reading it like fluently like it's english because it's similar like it's kind of like the sounds are similar and you gotcha. kind of get where it's okay. coming from um and it really i mean that and obviously um the original source the original source books um really got me into like the feeling of like what like anglo-saxon viking england was all about it was just it's it's such a dark gritty wild place where like no one knows whether magic or religion is like the thing the main thing it's all like it's it's all it's all pretty kind of uh, mad and um and, and and it was just really exciting um place wow. to get to play in. Uh, from the things you learned from um the history and the reading that you you looked into mm -hmm. did you bring anything uh, or what did you bring from that to Aldhelm, whether it be what you actually did on screen or maybe something in your costume? Did you put any input in that? I think I try and as much as I can, although I'm not a fighter like, um, like Utra's boys are, um, I try and bring some of the, what I, what I learned or read about um, Anglo-Saxon fighting start, like okay. styles into, into, the, into the stunt choreography I, in, a, in the tiny way that I can. Um, he's a Saxon fighter, so he always uses a shield. He doesn't get rid of his shield because without his shield, he's going to die. We had the helmets in in season two, which admittedly we in the end uh, got rid of. But um, helmets in Anglo-Saxon time was like the maybe your most prized possession after your sword. It was like one of the most important things cool. you could possibly own and be passed down from like father to son. To son it was like a, almost like a mystical object. That's cool. Um, so yeah, like trying to weave in little bits and, and bobs. But to be honest, uh, you know, Bernard Cornwall does it himself in the books already. Right. They're so f they're so full of um, historical knowledge, and uh, Stephen and then Martha, obviously, in, in this season, have kept that really um, as much as they can. I think in the scripts, which is great. Cool. Did you already have a background in then the the sword fighting? Was that something you had training in before, as far as from plays or uh, some other works? I mean, not a huge amount. Um, I'm, I, when I was a kid, uh, I didn't play like conventional like team sports much because I was rubbish at them um, and just couldn't, you know, catch a ball to save my life, um, which is, you know, there's a problem for most team sports. Um, so I got into uh, fencing, which I don't know, I don't know if you know, it's like a sort of type of like European sword fighting. Yeah, yeah, we have yeah, fencing, yeah. 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 And so from the age of about, th I think, 13 to the age of about 18, I fenced really, really seriously. I have to admit, it's maybe not that useful for co fight choreography because it's a very different type of, right. very, very different type of fighting. But it sort of helps a little bit because you're, you're good at learning routines. You're good at learning sequences. You're good sure, at kind of footwork, yeah. right? And, yeah, uh, exactly. Yeah. Footwork. Yeah. And, and, you know, and handwork and stuff. And, and all of the, all of the terms are pretty much the same. And you, uh, so you can communicate with the, you know, the stunt guys or, or Levente pretty easily. But no, I hadn't really done a huge amount of um, fight training. I mean, in, ter in, in general, I haven't done a huge amount of fighting on screen. To be honest, I think the only okay. other um, the only other job I've done where I had to do a significant amount of stunts was uh, a horror film called Patient Zero, where I had to play gotcha. a zombie, um, a very dangerous zombie. Um, so, <laughs> um, uh, so yeah, it was actually it was a big learning curve for me, but so I really enjoyed it. I saw you fight a little bit in um, Revenge, that little oh, short gosh, film. Wow, you found that? That's, that was that's, that was cool. That's, that's amazing. Yes, the my French fighting film. Yeah. Yes. That was pretty sweet. Yeah. <laughs> Those are some good fights. <laughs> but yeah, so what? tell us a little bit, of, what are some of the things you love about Aldhelm? Oh, wow. What do I love about Aldhelm? I, lo I think I love that he has a very clear sense of purpose. 
always i think like he yeah. really knows what it is he's meant to be doing on 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 earth and and he, and he goes and does it even though even if it puts him in like uh, like at fairly high levels of risk um it's something i really admire in in people and you know i think <laughs> i always wish i could maybe have more of in myself uh you know sort of like certain purpose and mm. you know definite drive so 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 that but also i think that he is in the end i think quite a quite a gentle human human person i, I think i mean like I we'll so. have to see like i mean he, well, he's he, go on what were you gonna what, what were you gonna say? i was gonna say well, there's a point where ethel flood says you know I, I, i'm beginning to think you're a good man and you're saying you say uh not quite or something yes. like that. yeah yeah, that's yeah so i think maybe yeah. <laughs> I, yeah, I see yeah. him as like a good guy i not at I this mean, point I, I, to be honest, uh, what I was going to say is that he, as, as you probably can um, imagine, uh, has surprised me a number of times uh, on my journey with him through this uh, uh, through this show. But I do think he has a good side to him. But yeah, you're, you're right. He also does have uh, a not good side to him. I mean, I think he enjoys killing Danes maybe a little bit too much <laughs> um, sometimes. That's uh, like the pastime I mean... back then though, right? <laughs> <laughs> they were everywhere. <laughs> Yeah, just a, there was like weeds. Yeah, yeah just down, <laughs> sprouting back up. Dude, what about horse riding then? Was that something you had any experience before getting into the Last Kingdom? Well, as I said, I grew up in the countryside. There were lots of horses around uh, where I grew up and loads of people re rode and stuff. And I did a bit of riding when I was a kid, but not a huge amount. Uh, and I actually found horses quite scary because they were big and unpredictable and I, mm. they didn't seem to trust me one bit. But I had the first job I ever did was um, a film called Wuthering Heights, uh, directed yep. by Andrew Arnold. And they, they mistakenly um, thought I was going to do a lot of riding in it. Um, and so they sent me for like quite extensive stunt riding training okay. um, just outside of London. Uh, and I was like, great, this is so great. Like I'm learning to ride again. This is amazing. What an incredible experience. And like the first day on set, they went, uh, yeah, we made a mistake. You don't ride in this film at all. <laughs> There's not a single scene where you ride. <laughs> uh, but it was great because it sort of set me up for just feeling a little bit more confident. And when I got to The Last Kingdom, I, I mean, I think I'd done a tiny bit of riding in a couple of other, uh, other TV shows. But when I, when I got there, I think I was very honest about really not being a particularly good rider, but the, the, the horse mistress and Levente and, like, and, and, all, and, and particularly my stunt double, actually, um, Attila Berosh, they got me up and riding so quickly and taught me so much over the last like three or four years uh, that I actually mm -hmm. feel, I actually really, I really enjoy riding now. It's not something I'd go like out and do, um, you know, for fun. Right. Um, Partly because I think it's maybe the most expensive hobby in the world, apart from, you know, being a helicopter pilot. Um, <laughs> um, so, um, uh, but I, yeah, I really love it. And we have great horses and um, yeah, I've learned a lot and I've, I've, I've really, I've really enjoyed that as well. That's we awesome. had Harry McIntyre on too before, and he, he plays Aethelwald yes. on the show. And he was telling yeah, us yeah. he had the same horse all the way through. Have you had the mm -hmm. same horse or different horses or? absolutely not i can have one or two different horses per season um which is which is actually really nice and i always get really really kind of sensible pretty docile horses maybe actually okay. up until season four where levante definitely gave me a slightly more um spirited horse because i think he felt i could deal with it was a joker no it, no it wasn't a man joker no, you, no i didn't want our joker joker is so big as well i, I don't know if um yep i told you that he's such a huge horse it's not he's not just like crazy he's also huge so it, it, which makes makes a big difference um no but i've had great horses i had a horse called satan i've had a i had a horse called harpoon and they're all yeah they're all brilliant and actually i always feel like i like i build some sort of relationship even in the, you know the short amount of time that i spend cool. with them um, because they're amazing animals and i mean i feel i feel a little bit like they're kind of just tolerating us on their back rather than us riding them they're like yeah, okay yeah we'll do we'll do this if levante says we have to but but in the normal in normal circumstances they'd be like you're not getting on me at all yeah <laughs> so in season three at the end you get stabbed uh mm. and <laughs> yes yes when you when you watch that scene and i know ethelred says like you know, if you survive this, you, may, you better obey me. And then you go to Ethel Fled's room and she says, you're not going to die. Was there, was there any point when you read that script or when, after you did the scene where you thought, oh, maybe they are going to kill me off? 
or did you know that you weren't going to die going into see the next season i mean to be completely off honest i think the uh the producers i mean everybody likes to um, like I, I mean i think we all have a sword hanging above our head at all times uh, as far as i'm aware <laughs> i mean i i, I don't I, I mean i think that even includes uh Uhtred. Totally. Just, there's always just a like there's just a sense that you might just die at any moment so i think going into that we weren't entirely sure and i think they purposefully left it ambiguous at the end of that season um as to whether they would want to bring Althelm back so i didn't know not for, for, a, for a long time but i think wow. if i'm right in saying i think by the end of the the end of that season they were pretty sure that they wanted me back but that you know they had it open either way if they if they'd have edited it all together and gone actually this feels like the end of the road for that character they could have mm. absolutely done that so i'm super grateful that he had he had a further life and he has a further and i got to imagine story. part of that is is how well liked they how much they liked your portrayal of that character too i would i would think and uh, yeah you'd hope you'd hope so you'd, you'd hope that they like you'd yeah. hope that they like me rather than just sort of tolerating me and going oh when when can we kill him God, <laughs> i'll find an opportunity this guy just hanging on in there we got the battle coming up at four here you know <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> We, yeah, we we didn't know if you were dead or not though uh, until I think we saw actually the Last Kingdom and they put out pictures of you uh, on set and we're like, oh, I, he made it then. He's he's all right. Yes, yeah. Unless I was just a really kind of like healthy looking ghost, then. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and now we now we have to wonder that about Ellsworth now. So I know. See, see, I I do think it, I think it is slightly a um, it's something they like to play with. I mean, like I think it's great going into a season not knowing exactly who you're gonna you're gonna come mm. come back to. Uh, and if there are characters sort of hanging in the balance, like like mm. I did and like El Elsworth is now, you know, it just I think it helps uh, it helps the drama. Totally. Yeah. And so you um, did you binge season four when it came out? Um, I I'm always a little bit uh, hesitant to watch stuff that I'm in generally okay. because um, it uh, it's not I, I don't love the exp the experience of watching myself. Gotcha. Um, but. I think particularly once once we've got to see, now we're on season four and I just I, I love the people I work with so much and the stuff that they do that I just really wanted to see them do it and I really wanted to see all the stuff that I hadn't seen that I wasn't involved in and so yeah I think I think we watched like the first me and my wife sat down and watched like the first five eps in a row like this the, the first day it came out and then then we had a bit of a break because we were like i was like we'll, we'll 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 take a break for a little bit and then we and then we binged like the rest at the end of the week because it is i think it's so good and there's such there's such such great performances in it i think people were doing such amazing stuff that it's just yeah. you know I, I wouldn't want to miss out on that so yeah we, we got we we got really stuck in this year did awesome. you know awesome. everything that was going to happen throughout the season? So I know, I think Magnus was telling us that he only knew what the, about the scenes he was in and he didn't know about the rest of the show. Did you know uh, um, what the rest I, of the show I try, was? So I try and, I think a lot of actors don't like to read stuff that's not, that doesn't involve their character. And I, can, I completely understand. Okay. Um, I like really, I really like reading the scripts in, in, in their entirety so that I get some sense of like the world that I'm in and the story that I'm in, in that episode or in, in, in that season. Uh, so no, I, I knew what was going to happen, but you never really know exactly how it's going to turn out in the edit and how, and because, you know, they do such, they, you know, do such incredible stuff in the edit and with SFX and stuff that you, you could, the stuff, the stuff that you can read on the page, once it's actually on the screen, it feels like a whole different thing. So it does feel like you're, even if you've read all of the scripts and you know the story basically back to front, um, it feels like you're, you're seeing something completely fresh once you see it actually on the screen. Were you then, were you surprised then with how it ended or did you already know that it was going to end the way it did? Was Aylesworth kind of lingering in the balance? Did you know Uhtred was going to wind up with Ethel, Ethel Stan? No, so, so so much of this stuff, because again, as I'm sure other actors have told you, um, the scripts come out like bit by bit. We, we usually have seen the first four, two or four episodes when we start and then uh, they come, um, you know, probably like, a few weeks into the filming of the of, of what, whatever we're filming and we just kind of we work from there and lots of stuff changes in between that time so it's constantly changing and evolving and adapting to whatever's been filmed or how things are going what's working what's not working it's, it's kind of a crazy it's a kind of crazy way to work but it's obviously it's, it's the best way to make sure that you're adapting best to 
the circumstances and, and like and you know taking characters in ways that they seem to organically need to go in or that kind of thing and so i think that stuff some of the stuff at the end i maybe didn't know until the, like the last week of filming like the, the stuff yeah the stuff about athelstan the stuff about although it all completely makes sense the the idea that elswith might be so sick that she might not survive all that kind of stuff was um was really last minute but which kind of made it really exciting to see it <laughs> when you actually see it on screen because you you at that point you're in the middle of a battle you've hardly really had time to register some of the new script changes that aren't necessarily to do with you um, so when you actually see it on screen you're like oh wow that is that that works that's great um steve did you uh you and colby bond over over movies and like yeah screen stuff that's, uh, when you uh, got to know each other that's that's how we uh really got became friends i mean we were we were close in school because we had every single class together. We had the same exact schedule, every sure. lab. Uh, but I, I think we, we at times were kind of stressed and tense with each other. Uh, sure. Not necessarily because we hate each other, but yeah. I mean, we were seeing each other all the time or in a stressful situation. Uh, but then uh, at some point we, we started watching the Marvel movies because yeah. you had only seen a few and then uh, the trailer for Infinity War came out and you were like, I have to watch all the Marvel movies now. So we started binging those all together. Um, and in the winter there, we were in Erie PA and the winter there was really oh, bad. Yeah. Okay. Um, we, if there was like a record snowfall there, we're right next to a lake too. Uh, so we were all trapped together uh, like all winter. And that's, that's kind of how we bonded. Totally. And the Last Kingdom, honestly, too. Uh, we started watching that in my room uh, with the AC on, I think. <laughs> uh <laughs> you like instantly became like one of our favorite shows i think we like we skipped over it a bunch because we didn't necessarily think the trailer looked super special for the season one trailer we okay. we like watched it we weren't sure um we kept trying other shows and when we 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 were so wrong <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we were so wrong. yeah it it was one of those ones thanks, Netflix thanks for sticking with us oh my thanks god it's, it's, it. It, yeah it's uh it easily became our our favorite show um for us i mean yeah we even we even did a, a podcast on our top 10 shows of the 2010s and it was at our our number one for both of us so <laughs> that was it was awesome it was so awesome. what are what are some of the things that you think makes the last kingdom so such a great show i think uh some of the stuff that makes it so great is its attention to detail and yeah. um the fact that i think it puts so much effort into the historical realism uh, of the period i mean it doesn't of course it doesn't get everything perfectly right i, mean, I think that would be impossible right. it would then then it would just be a documentary drama it wouldn't be as interesting um, either right it would just be yeah 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. you gotta you gotta have some license um so you know there's always going to be stuff that's not like exactly right but also who knows we weren't there like i, I like n none of us know it's like to be there this is sort of our best guess um so it's that and and i think it takes it it kind of takes everything that we love about fantasy and tries to like ground a lot of that in like a real historical uh, moment yeah um and yeah as i as i said when i was talking about kind of anglo-saxon history and how crazy it is when you actually start to get into it these these characters that were running around england in you know the eighth and ninth century that they're they're, they're incredible characters they're, they're worthy of any fantasy novel they're worthy of any kind of like great like epic franchise Ooh. they're um they're, they're they're a mad group of like incredible uh, you know warriors kings queens um priests you know yeah. like wise men and women all these like all these crazy characters running around and um, that i think it's just uh, a really cool world to to kind of immerse yourself in or at least i find it and speaking of fantasy and you being a huge fantasy fan, we always talk about how The Last Kingdom almost makes you think it could be something more than just uh, reality. Mm -hmm. But there's always, a, there's always a rational explanation for it, too. And I think, yeah. I mean, I don't know if you could speak to how the show is, has so masterfully kind of left it up to people's interpretations, especially like the, Harry said it best about the perspectives in the show. It really kind of shows each person's perspective and how religion like influences everything. I don't know if you could speak to that. No, I think what Harry said is, is completely right. I, I, I did hear what he said and I think he, he's got it right on that it's, it is about perspective. And I think the fact that Uhtred is both, you know, he's both Saxon and the Dane and he like mixes those two cultures together within himself 
it means that you both have that there is a sense that he he definitely believes uh, all of the the myth the mythology of the old gods and the old magic yeah. and you know the, the curse that's put on you know the curse that's put on breeder uh, mm. the power of skade uh, all, all that stuff uh, but also he he lives in like a predominantly christian world where where all that stuff is is deemed to be complete like to be nonsense or heresy or whatever right um so yeah so that it's like i don't know it's sort of like the shadow walker walking yes. the line between the you know the the dark and the light or the you know the shadows of the old gods and the the light of this new kind of this new civilization or this new this new way of putting like new way of thinking about the world totally. um but i'm i'm obs i'm absolutely obsessed with like even more than actually like normal fantasy i'm obsessed with fantasy that gets that grounds itself in realism and i think like there aren't that many shows that yeah. like really heavily try and do it i think our show is is one of them but there totally others, agree there's such other great examples i think um i don't know if you saw the first season of true detective um I uh, not, no. there's a, which is kind of all it's like southern gothic and again it just walks this line of you're like is there like a curse on this like land or it's like is there some kind of supernatural thing going on or is it just like some crazy people who are really unpleasant and I'll i love that to the being list. in I, yeah you you, de you should definitely watch it and i mean there, I, there's, there's so many other great examples but um i love i love uh i love books i love i love film i love tv that tries to walk that line where you're not completely sure whether there is this entirely mysterious world that we're just not aware of or if or, the, or there isn't or we and yeah. we just or just what we see is what we get um because i think it's such a because i think that's sort of the world that we kind of live in if we if we let ourselves which, which is both like full of mystery and also pretty straightforward when you when you get down to it oh totally yeah totally agree so we know we already know you got acting down you got photography down any other passions <laughs> i'm not sure i've got any of it down. oh you've got it down man uh any other passions that you have I mean, to be honest, to be honest, it's really like it's film, um, like stuff right. around, 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 the, around screen, but particularly Sarah is, is like really um, what's magic to me. And so I, you know, I, I produce a little bit. I we yeah. make films with friends. Um, I've started getting into actually making film on cine film and like processing it myself and that kind of thing. Cool. It's just a really fun process. I mean, it's a, it's a hobby really, but it all feeds into the kind of, you know to, to what i do professionally as well um so i just yeah i love i love anything that's like telling a story um and uh and i've actually re recently got into ga gaming for the first time in my entire life oh. yeah it's, it's it's kind of weird because as a kid uh I've, I've already sort of like suggested that like we had we had no tv we only had like vhs cassettes we were only allowed to watch stuff that like my like my parents had like chosen that they thought was okay for us um and we definitely weren't allowed a console like no consoles like within like a thousand miles of our um of our of our house um and so i um i recently bought a console for myself because i was like this is ridiculous i'm like i'm in my late 20s and i've never played any i've like <laughs> hardly played any computer games in my entire life and i just i got i got a ps i got a ps4 oh, there you uh, go. and i got um the last of us and um and like some other just blockbuster games and just like and just absolutely gotten into them and i'm the worst gamer on the planet i'm so bad at it but it's uh i, I really i'm really beginning to love it as a storytelling medium and I, I love cinematic games like red dead redemption 2 and god of war anything to do with Norse mythology i i love so uh senua's sacrifice which is a, a british indie game about um, a celtic warrior going to find her her husband in um, the Norse underworld and stuff like like anything like that. I'm just completely into. I think it's so, it's so they, they're really, really they're, they're creating such amazing stories in games now. And totally I really appreciate the, that's the a, that's the thing now. When I'm telling people uh, like my girlfriend, she's like, "Why are you playing video games?" I'm like, "It's the, it's the same as you watching the movie with me downstairs." It's all. Yeah. It's yeah. it is. It is. Yeah, it is. Yeah. It is. Uh, yeah. We, Did you? Um, sorry, go I ahead. If I missed me. it when I dropped out. Did you play Jedi Fallen Order? No, I haven't actually. I but I did when I was a kid. I remember on a um on a, on my I played some of the Star Wars games on my friends. Uh, I think it must have been PS3 at the time, um, or even like or just even PS. Um, so yeah, I have played, but I haven't played the the recent ones. No, actually, I I actually find I find it quite difficult to transition from like uh a, like a cinema world that I love 
uh, like Lord of the Rings, for example, into a gaming yeah. world because I'm sort of like, oh, okay. I don't, don't want. I'm getting in the way of these real char- of, these, of these characters that I love, and I'm messing I'm messing up the world. Um, gotcha. So I, no, I haven't actually played. I haven't played Jedi. Well, that that game happens to be like that. Really, kind of feels like its own movie. Like you could take out all the gameplay, put in like all the cinematic scenes, and it would be a pretty good movie. Oh, um, really? So if you are still a big Star Wars fan, we do recommend that. Yes. Okay, I'll, I'll check it out. What are some of your other films then, too? You were telling us you're very passionate about films. What are some of your, your top films? You don't have to go one, two, three, four, five or anything, but what, what are some of your, your things that kind of shows your taste? Oh, it's so difficult, man, because there's just so many films. Um, and like I, I don't have like a particularly like uniform taste. Uh, like I just find myself like flitting around like different world cinemas, British cinema, American cinema, wherever. Um, I think one of my favorite films is um actually just one of my favorite filmmakers is the russian filmmaker tarkovsky which i I came to quite late actually my wife got me into uh when we first started dating i love his film stalker which is um uh, an amazing kind of sci-fi film like early russian sci-fi film again it's one of those films that you're not really sure if something weird is happening to them Mm. in the place they because they go on this it's, it's a story about these people that go on this journey through a, an alien infected zone um and all this kind of weird stuff happens to them all the way through it's done by like done by like inc- really amazing like camera suggestion and like tricks in time and sound and stuff Ooh, um, that's cool so i, I mean I, I love i love his work um when i was younger i really liked um the work of a french filmmaker called um called Leo Carax, uh, who worked with Juliette Binoche a lot and Denis Levant, um, films like um, The Night is Young or um, uh, the, the Lovers of the, the Ninth Bridge, I think it is in, um, in French. Um, uh, but yeah, I mean, like, but then at the same time, I like, I hardcore love the Lord of the Rings trilogy. I yeah. yeah. I, I like, I love the Star Wars, the, the, particularly the early Star Wars films. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I kind of love I love all cinema really I can uh, I can sit in a I can sit in a darkened cinema and watch almost anything and still and just be like wow this is pretty impressive well based have you watched the, the show dark it's like I think it's a German oh show. my god oh my god that because just I based on your excited about that but that oh. is one of my favorite shows. My, 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 oh, it's so my, good me and my wife's favorite shows it's so good it's I was just gonna say based on what you just described there yeah. uh like you would be interested in the show and obviously you are. <laughs> yeah. It's phenomenal. I haven't seen the new season yet, but I'm excited to watch that. It's, uh, man, I think it's one of my favorite. It's definitely one of my favorite shows. I think it, it won the Rotten Tomatoes Netflix like show off against Black Mirror. Oh, really? Something. Yeah, it's like the wow. highest rated ever, uh, ever wow. Netflix show. Which obviously I'm like, come on, Lost Kingdom, but like, I'll give it to you. <laughs> it Dark. should be Last Kingdom. Dark, Dark, Dark is be Last an Kingdom. excellent, excellent show. <laughs> Uh, and I think they've got a new season coming in uh, a couple of, hopefully a couple of months. Cool. Is that season two? No, that's season f- three. Season three. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. So I still haven't seen the new one, the, the newest one that's out, I think. Oh, man. Um, your, your, your mind will melt. Your mind will melt. Oh, yeah? Great. Yeah, I just, I, Love I that. find anything, anything to do with like time travel and like and mystery and stuff like that. Yeah. yeah. I'll eat, I'll they do it so well. Yeah. They do it so well, too. Cool. So what other goals do you have as an actor? Um, I don't, I think when you, when you start out, you, you have all of these kind of like this kind of bucket list of like, I want to work with this person. I want to work with this person. I want to do this, do that, this type of film, that type of film. And to be honest, I think that I've, I've already worked with some, some people who I never thought I'd work with. Like, I mean, like, like like working with Lars von Trier, even if it was just for a week, was like I was like I, I really can't believe this is happening to me. Even my first job with Andrea Arnold, I was like this again. This doesn't this doesn't make sense that this is my life. Um, wow. But uh, so I think that um, as much as possible, I just try and wait and see what comes, and 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 see the opportunities as they as they arise, and and see what like path. Uh, it is that um, kind of I should take. I mean, I love performing so much and I love performing in theatre. I love performing in film. I love performing in TV. I love all of the different um, kind of mediums in which in which I get to, to act. Um, and so I don't have any um, any particular desire really except to keep 
getting to work with people I really like on like on on projects that I find exciting and I, and it, whether, it, it, whatever medium that's in uh, I mean if, even if it's games um, like I just want to do that because I don't know for me acting's always felt a little bit like the second best thing to being an explorer uh, without okay. you know, having to strap on an oxygen tank and climb Everest because you kind of get to go into even even if it's just on stage but like more so when you're filming you go into the kind of wild with this crazy bunch of people and you go and make this this thing out or usually away from the rest <laughs> of civilization and then you come back and you're like look what we've made um and i love that feeling and i you get you get it most i think from like independent film um but we still get it on on the last kingdom there's this there's there is this feeling that we're just we're you know we're out there trying to do this thing and uh, and then we get back we get to come back and like share what we found with everyone else and and that's that's a really exciting thing i, I just love the process of you know get, getting out there exploring exploring a world exploring a character exploring stories it's just it's it's great and when you get to do it with people you really like that's the best thing ever that's awesome that's awesome so what are some things we can look forward to uh with you coming out in the future so well i mean as 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 everything is kind of shut down everything is very much up in the air there's a couple of other projects that i was attached to um that were due to start filming um or to, or to start being on stage in the next couple of months but we just have to see where okay. what happens with them uh i, I made a straight after the show i made a um uh, a film called a clever woman with a, a british director called john sanders so that'll be well, that's in that's in post-production now and so they're finishing that off Sweet. Uh, and I also did a, a BBC radio show that's coming out in June. Uh, okay. Which is com like completely different. It's, co it's a comedy about a guy in the north of England who's stuck with his uncle after he's done some terrible thing in banking and like melted down the world economy. And he's just sort of hiding out and just like living with the locals and trying to like adjust to this new new kind of like pace of life. So that's really fun with some like incredible actors like Philip Jackson and Alison Steadman and stuff. Um, so there's bits and bots coming out, but really, like we're, I feel like we're enter we've entered into this crazy period of uncertainty. So, the I don't, I'm not, I can't, I, I can't mention the other things that I was attached to yet because who knows where they'll be in, you know, six months. But there's lots of really exciting stuff coming up. I feel really lucky. Do you have any favorite scenes? I know we've talked about a lot of cool scenes that you've been a part of. Do you have any favorite ones that you've done from The Last Kingdom? Is I. Favorite scenes always feel like they they're like divided into scenes that you love doing as like a as like an actor. Ah, uh, yeah. Because of the because of, but, but, and I, I can talk about both. Like I mean, one of my favorite scenes definitely was is is just simply that moment with Ethel fled in the battle in season in season four. I love doing that because it was cool. A really interesting moment to to get to do. But um, I think in season in season two, one of my favorite moments just as a person, yeah, um, was I can't remember. It might be in episode eight um or seven where ethel red um gets we 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 enter with utrid we enter the dane camp of eric and siegfried um yeah. and um and ethel, ethel, ethel red ethel gets knocked out and ends up waking up naked in uh, yes. in the Wayland? yeah where's Wayland? <laughs> that's awesome um at Wayland, what a massive man that man was um, yeah yeah, he was taller and, than uh, the other. What's it, Magnus? Right, the guy. Who yeah, I mean, the, 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 that season was a fascinating season for having such big men in it that just made everyone look tiny. Like made Alex look like a small, like like yeah. a small <laughs> machine of a man. <laughs> suddenly, we were just in the presence of these giants like Adrian Boucher and Magnus Samuelson, yeah. even bigger, and then Wayland coming in. Yeah. Um, but. Uh, I love. I enjoyed that scene for, probably for like the all the wrong reasons because it was so cold, um, and we were shooting it sort of at night or at least in the evening, and we had um, Bjorn and uh, and Christian who played uh, eight, yeah. uh, Siegfried and Eric, uh, who were really fun characters to to hang out with, um, and then obviously all of Utrecht's gang as well. And we're just having that kind of like we're having a dinner scene where we're trying to have a drink uh, and trying to like just kind of lay low in this super tense situation. And poor, poor Toby just having to come in and out, in and out, yeah. just dre like dressed in literally nothing, um, and having to be covered over, like in the, in the on the coldest day on set, like see, awesome. uh, Bjorn sitting at the end of the table trying to eat a chicken leg, and he's so cold he's just shivering. He can't put it in his mouth. We're all just absolutely frozen, and yet 
poor Toby has to like run around like with <laughs> not single thread on uh, and he was so good about it but it was just it just felt like the most absurd situation and like I, I don't think none of us could hold it together like none of us oh, could that's hold awesome. it together at all and actually one of my favorite things <laughs> in life is is corpsing obviously not when it ruins like ruins a take or ruins a scene but like okay. the moment when you're having to keep a laugh in because something <laughs> is happening you've just got to keep it together is one of the best because the moment you get to let it out once the once the camera cuts is like the biggest relief on <laughs> like oh god it's like, <laughs> it's like holding your breath for a moment, particularly when it's not you on camera, um, you're, just, you're just trying to keep it super professional when something crazy and ridiculous is happening. Uh, it's like the story of Steve and our life when we're in, we were in class and school together. <laughs> yes, that was us all the time. We would always message each other something funny, just ridiculous things, and we're just trying to keep it together. I had to get up. I I was le- I would leave every now and then. I'd be like crying, tears. People like, what was going wrong, Steve? What was what was happening with you? And. I don't know we messaged something in group me just dumb and <laughs> had to hold it in. I think the best laugh is the laugh that you're not you can't have. Yeah, yes, yeah. the situation is like you know, as a kid when we'd be in like I'd be in church with my brother uh, and um, and just like you you couldn't laugh and that was the best place to laugh. That's the place yeah, to yeah, laugh yeah. Most. Yeah. totally did you know you had to go in with a bowl cut oh god a- yeah I, how, how have you not asked me that already I was like that's the question I have to prep for. Um, <laughs> no, I, um, I, I think it was one of those situations that you go into, you go into makeup and Kate Benton, who was the first makeup, uh, supervisor who, um, hair and makeup supervisor who I was in the show with, uh, who's amazing. I think in a way she was sort of trying to push the boundaries of what she could get away with, with me. She was like, you, yeah, you know, they really, everyone this is just a normal haircut for, for the period we've given everyone one of these and, and you're like really oh okay yeah oh cool i'm i'm really down with that I said, that looks great I, I, and you're thinking i guess i won't be stuck with this forever you know the, the haircuts change um and uh and yeah when you walk out of that trailer with that bowl which a number of us have experienced i don't know like you and for example there's another great bowl cut um even young utrid this season has a little bit yes of a bowl cut. Um, you, you walk out, oh yeah, Oshin, who plays Whitgar, bit of a bowl cut. Yeah, uh, yeah. You, you walk out and you go, hang on, why is not everybody else got a bowl? <laughs> These dames are really, 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 really great and handsome. Why have I, why am I wearing a bowl cut? But it's, it's kind of, I kind of like it because it's, you know, it's different. There aren't going to be many, many things that you're, uh, that you, that you act in where that's the, that's the look you have to go for. Um, and any, anything, again, anything that, anything to be more historically accurate, like I'm down with, even if it means that I do have to look like one of the members of Dumb and Dumber. Well, that was just what was in back then, man. Absolutely. I mean, I'm, I'm the and, coolest guy in the Saxon set. That's, uh, that's and I think cool. since last kingdom came out, kids started shaving the sides of their heads again. <laughs> Go back I, yeah, to that I'd, I'd like to think that's, that's <laughs> it's i think it's the quarantine cut now people moms are just putting bowls on their kids heads and, and just going yeah. like that and they're doing yeah. <laughs> it's low maintenance it's a low maintenance cut what can i say i want to fade and i just want to keep going up just keep going <laughs> <laughs> just keep it long on top please <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome that's awesome well, we can't thank you enough for coming on and chatting yes. with us this has really been a pleasure it's really all, guys. Thank you so much for having me. It's been really lovely. Yeah, if you like our talk with James, make sure to check him out on The Last Kingdom. Uh, season four is streaming now. If you haven't already seen it, go see it. Do yourself a favor. Go see it. Uh, we'll link his social media and stuff down below the, the video podcast too. Uh, you want to see his other works he's in, make sure to check him out. Uh, but, but thanks for being on the show. Uh, and, is, and is there anything else uh, you want to tell the fans out there? No, not at all, except for just thank you so much for everyone that supported the show and made, has made it what it is, because really, like, we've, we found it grow from, like, strength to strength, and that literally is just because of the fans. It's been, a, it's been an amazing thing to, uh, to, to be a part of. Nice. Thank, thanks nice, again, cool. James. Uh, and everyone out there listening to this, if you want to check us out, you can check us out on YouTube or podcast. Check out our talk here. Uh, we're on we're The Screen Chronicles. Make sure to check us out on social media and is that as well. Uh, but again, Thank you, James. Uh, thank you, Colby. Thank you, Colby, for showing oh, up welcome. today. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, but yeah, goodbye, everyone. We'll see you. Yeah.